Hello friends, welcome to the Church of the Apostles. Thank you for joining us today, wherever you are around the world. We pray that God will use this time to bless you and that the Holy Spirit will speak to you in a personal way today. One of America's most respected professor of law by the name of Jonathan Turley. He was testifying before Congress, and he said something to the effect, everyone in America is angry. Politicians are angry. People are angry. My family is angry. My kids are angry. Even my dog is angry, and I'm angry. And I thought about this long and hard and realized that it's not only in America that there's anger and outrage, and not only in America, from Paris, France, to Hong Kong, and everywhere in between, there is an outrage. There's an anger. Outrage dominates the news night after night after night. There are wars not happening only in the streets of Baghdad or Syria or Hong Kong or Paris or Washington, D.C. There are war internally in individuals. There are wars in homes. There are wars uh, among institutions and, and even businesses. And yet the amazing thing that in the midst of all this, we have a word of prophecy about this outrage, which I'm going to share with you this morning. Because a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Psalm 2 prophesied of the coming of God's Messiah. One thousand years before the birth of Jesus, David said and invited people to believe in the Son of God. He was not born for another thousand years, and yet back a thousand years before he was born, David said, come, believe in the Son, lest the Father be angry. A thousand years before Christ's birth, the Bible prophesied, of the supremacy of Jesus Christ in a day when even 60% of so-called believers say there are many ways to God. God could not only have one way. Jesus, God said through the, His psalmist that when Jesus comes, that His Son, who coexisted with Him before eternity, is the only one. He's the only way. And you say to me, Michael, how do you know that Psalm 2 is really fulfilled in in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ, very simply. You know, in this church, we interpret the Scripture by the Scripture. And in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 24, if you, those of you taking notes, I'll repeat it again. Acts 4, 24 says that Psalm 2 was written a thousand years before Christ was born is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, it says that Psalm 2 found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 27, and in chapter 12, verse 5, proclaim that Psalm 2 is a prophecy regarding the coming of the Christ of God. And so, let me now invite you to join with me in reading this psalm. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? Go. Stand rule against together. Lost against.
The amazing thing about this psalm is that it divides itself into four segments, and it's very clear. You will, as we go through it, you will see it with clarity. Four segments. The first segment, you see it in verses 1 to 3, and it's about man's defiance of God. I call it angry defiance. Then in verses 4 to 6, you see the Father's astounding derision toward that defiance. And then thirdly, you see it in verses 7 to 9, you see the Son, absolute dominion. And then finally, verses 10 to 12, you see the Holy Spirit's ability or to deliver. Now, here's the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is in this psalm. And I hope you are going to remember angry defiance, astounding derision, absolute dominion, and able deliverance. Man's angry defiance, as I already told you, it's going everywhere. I'm going to say more about this in a minute. But the psalm asks, why? Why do nations rage? Why do they plot and, 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 and conspire? Why, why do you conspire against the Lord? Why, why the whole world in as a state of outrage? And why is this? Uh, I, you don't have to watch television for any length of time without asking that question. Why is the world in turmoil? Why is that anger? Why, why uh, whole organizations and movements are founded for the purpose of resisting biblical morality? Why are so many lobbying groups or lobbying organizations are founded for the sole purpose of promoting immorality an abomination, uh, promoting rebellion, promoting the obliterating of God's absolutes. Why? Why so many groups are demanding that we worship the creation instead of the Creator? Why, why, why do they seek to disintegrate righteousness from the nation? Why? Why do the whole nations hate God? Why do they hate His Son? Why do they hate the children, His children and the followers of His Son, who they get persecuted and tortured and even put to death? Well, the answer is found here in Psalm 2. These groups and nations who hate God, and they hate God's anointed Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, they express their hatred toward Him. They express their hatred toward the Messiah by taking it out on His children, taking it out on His followers. Listen to me. They may hate each other, these groups. Uh, they may uh, deplore each other. Uh, they may fight with each other. But they become united on one thing, their hatred of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and their outrage is expressed in their outrage toward the true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In my book, The Hidden Enemy, if you haven't read it, read it, because really you don't know the hidden enemy until you come to the end of the book. But there, a very, with clarity, the largest two groups uh, in the world today, militant Islam and secular humanism, the left, uh, the, the extreme left, they deplore each other. They don't, given their brothers, they will kill each other. But they get united over one thing, against Christians. They are like the beehives of an unholy industry. They swarm to around an equally godless media. Uh, they denounce righteousness. They spread false narratives. Oh, but they come across as very loving, even prayful. They hide behind tortured interpretation of the Constitution. They hide behind some tortured interpretation of biblical language. They even hide behind false, false historical narratives. But why? Here comes because they believe that God's moral absolutes is like a chain around their necks that they want to try to remove it. 
uh, because it's stopping them from promoting their perversion. So they try to get rid of it. But sadly for those of us who love Jesus, those of us who love God, sadly for us, <laughs> we long for them to come and know how loving God is. We long for them to come and know how good God is. We long for them to come and know how beautiful and enlightening His absolutes are. We long for them to come to know His Son who loved them and died on a cross for their sins. But instead of gratitude to God for common graces, because the Bible said the sun shines for the righteous and the unrighteousness. And if you look at material blessings in this country, the material blessings is coming on the righteous and the unrighteousness and the unrighteous. They, they, instead of being grateful to God, they're angry. They're angry. They rebel against God. They revolt against His love, and they reject His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1.25 says, they knew the truth, but they preferred to believe a lie, for they exchanged the truth of the Word of God for a lie. And they worshiped and they served the creature rather than the Creator. This rage and this outrage is going to reach its climax the closer we come to the return of Christ. It may have been in certain parts of the world. Now it's all over the world. And it's going to grow in intensity the closer we get to the return of Christ. Are you surprised? Are you surprised? Here is the fallacy that so many people really bought into. It's very sad. They convince themselves that they can live in freedom without submitting to God. Beloved, imagine any country including ours, that the powers to be decided that they're going to suspend all laws. No laws. <laughs> Even for a day. So they're going to suspend it in favor of total freedom. You would say, Michael, that would be hell on earth. And you'll be exactly right. <laughs> what God haters do not realize is that freedom without authority is anarchy, and that authority without freedom is slavery. And that is why the Bible is very clear that true freedom, true liberty is found when we live under the authority of God. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, the founders of this great nations, they understood that. They really did. They, that's why George Washington said the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written for Christian people. It is not written for these secularists who, who try to pretend they love the Constitution. It's pure fantasy to think that they can have freedom without God. It's impossible. And therefore, man express angry defiance toward the most holy God. Secondly, you find here in this psalm, the second section, is the Father's astounding derision over their defiance. Derision. Now, some people, church people, don't want to think of God as having a derision. They really don't, because they want to think of Him as Santa Claus. Ho, ho, ho. You know, it's kind of, yeah, He's benign. You know, kind of God, toothless, powerless, milk toast God, who just should give them everything they ask for. And if they don't get it, they get angry with Him. Beloved, this is a totally false view of God. To be sure, God's love is expressed in His grace, not in His weakness. God's love is expressed uh, in His benevolence not in his powerlessness and helplessness, but when God's haters, I call them God's haters, defy God, what does God do? What does God do? The Bible said, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? The Bible said that he laughs. He laughs. Here it is, verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Why? <laughs> 
Because God is the God of power and might. Because God exercises His authority over the universe, whether they like it or not. Because God rules the universe, whether they acknowledge it or not. Because God controls every event in history, whether they believe it or not. Because God is not sitting in heaven drinking Mylanta or antacid and saying, I have a heartburn. I don't know what to do with these foolish people. Who would do? It's not wringing his hands. Who, oh, what I'm going to do? They're rejecting me. No, 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 no. The Bible said he laughs. He laughs at them. But, beloved, listen carefully because this is very important. This is not a pleasant laughter. It's not a joyful laughter. Now, I like to laugh as much as anybody, okay? This is a laughter of derision. Ha, 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 ha. You think that you can re- get rid of me and my absolutes? You might as well reach for the sky and pull the stars down. <laughs> you think that they can move me, remove me from my throne? They might as well tell the sun not to shine. If they think that they can reinvent me <laughs> and to be made in their own image and their own likeness, Might as well ask them to control the rain and the storm and the floods. They might as well be able to gather the oceans in a bucket. Rots of rock. (laughs) Listen, I know that, and you know that no illustration is ever perfect. But imagine a mouse defying a lion, (laughs) and you get the idea. Get close to it. (laughs) But if you study history, you found out that in uh, 300 years after Christ, during those 300 years, there were 30 Roman emperors, 30 Roman emperors. Every one of them distinguished themselves by their zeal to persecute Christians and persecute Christ. One study had shown that every one of those 30 emperors, every one of them, died a miserable death. Some were deranged. Some were physically blinded. Uh, Some uh, were assassinated by family members. Uh, Some died in miserable captivities. Others drowned. Others died of horrible flesh-eating diseases. Others committed suicide. Every one of them died a horrible death, and the Christian faith marches on. Emperor Diocletian, he ruled from 245 to to 313. 245, 313. He was so proud of his accomplishment that he struck a medal. And on that medal, one side was his face, And on the other side, it read as follows, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximian, Hercules, Caesar Augustus, for having extended the Roman Empire east and west. And here it comes, and here it comes. And for having extinguished the name of Christianity, who brought ruin to the republic. (laughs) Ruin. Extinguished. They're all dead. Jesus is on the throne in heaven. (laughs) They're all dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Look at verse 5. Then he rebuked them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, on my holy hill. (laughs) You see, man's angry defiance to God. The father's astounding derision over their defiance. And thirdly, the son's absolute dominion. Verses 7 to 9. Absolute dominion. The son of God was prophesied about, of course, starts all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and throughout the Old Testament pages. And that's why these people to say, you know, ditch the Old Testament, that is foolishness. 
because every page of the Old Testament prophesied of Jesus. And here, a thousand years before His incarnation, here, a thousand years before the first Christmas and the pre-incarnate Christ, He says, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery. Now, beloved, listen to me. You know and I know. Today, the name of Jesus is a free for all, free for all to abuse, to defame, to deface, to belittle, a free for all to outlaw from the land and to outlaw from public life and reject and despise Him. Yet thousand years before Christ was born, God said of His Son, He is my anointed one for everyone's salvation. Not for some, everyone. He is the only choice, my choice, for forgiveness of sins. He is your only way to me. He is your only way to my heaven. He is your only way who will judge every human being. Why? Because the whole earth belongs to Him. He bought the earth by His blood was shed on Calvary. He paid for it with His blood. He took ownership of the earth from Satan, who was lost to Satan by Adam when he blew it, because God initially handed those earth deeds to Adam. And when Adam rebelled against God and disobeyed God, he inadvertently handed the deeds to Satan. But now Jesus owns it. Now, when you listen to those dear people, th these God-haters, I call them, you know, you would think that they're the ones who own the earth. You know, to me, they sound like a bunch of property renters. This is a group of renters in a building. And because they have not seen the property owner with their eyes, haven't seen him, they begin to convince themselves, delude themselves into thinking, well, he doesn't exist. We are the owners. <laughs> we own this. Uh, they own the property. They don't, yet, they don't need to pay rent. <laughs> that goes on until the real owner, the true owner, shows up. <laughs> and the sparks fly except it's not sparks, it's going to be the fire of hell. What a surprise and a shock they are in. What a surprise and a shock. Let me tell you something here. Whether you're around the world watching or you're here in this building, you don't have to be among them. You don't have to be among them. If you have never invited Jesus Christ, the owner of the earth, the God of the universe, to come into your life and forgive your sins when you repent, you can do that today. You can do that today. And then you can live the rest of your life not in fear that the owner is going to show up, but in joyous expectations. You can't wait for him to show up. I have news for you. Jesus owns the earth. Jesus owns everything on the earth. Jesus owns everyone on the earth. And one day, sooner or later, I think it's more sooner than later, at least that's my personal opinion, He's going to show up. <laughs> what a glorious day that's going to be. And those who have rejected Him will weep. And those who have received Him will rejoice, will rejoice, exceedingly glad. And those who have rejected Him, they'll be in a terrible state of terror and fear. A thousand years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, God the Father said, He is my beloved Son. And a thousand years plus later, the same God the Father spoke on top 
of the River Jordan, and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And soon, sooner than any of us might think, we were going to hear, yes, Jesus is the only one because we're going to see him sitting on his throne, ruling with an iron scepter, judging every human being as ever existed. And here's my speculation. I always tell you, if it's a speculation on my part, I think God the Father is going to say, hey, I told you so. <laughs> I told you that he's my only son. I told you it's your only way to heaven. I warned you. Beloved, it is the will of the Father for the Son to inherit the earth. It is the will of the Father. So let me ask you a question. Do you think Satan knows that? Because he knows the Old Testament. He knows the Bible. The Bible said, here's the thing. Now we have people rejecting the Bible. The Bible said Satan actually believed the Scripture, and he trembles. <laughs> That's a lot more than some church folks they don't tremble. Satan does. Why else do you think that in the wilderness, Satan tried to offer Jesus a shortcut? A shortcut. He said, I'll give you this earth. I'll give it to you. You know that I took it from Adam. I give it to you, but I'm going to give you a shortcut. Why don't you take it now? Just bow to me. Just bow to me. I'll give it to you. I think if Jesus spoke in English, he would have said to Satan, buzz off, Satan. <laughs> buzz off. <laughs> no shortcuts. It's mine. The earth is mine. The earth deeds belong to me, which you took from Adam when he blew it in the garden. But I'm going to take it back by shedding my blood on the cross of Calvary. I'm going to take it back by my full obedience to the plan of the Father. Oh, my beloved friends, my beloved friends, listen to me. Satan is making the same offer today to millions of people around the world. He is. He's offering shortcuts. He's offering daily, daily shortcuts why? To make them avoid responding to the love of God in Christ Jesus. You don't have to do that. You're a good person. You haven't really committed all the big sins. You're a fine person. You, you did okay. It's not really your fault. It's your family's fault. It's your parents' fault. It's your environment's fault. It's everything. So don't worry about it. God is going to let everybody in in the end. Millions of shortcuts he's offering to everyone, everyone, everyone. But the Father said, the Father said, ask me and I will make the nations to be your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possessions. And he did on the cross. I don't mind telling you that this verse causes me Spending every waking moment, every one of my waking moments, thinking, planning, working on how to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the end of the earth. That motivates me. Here's my personal view. I believe with all my heart that the Lord's greatest disappointment is when He sees His children, those whom He redeemed with His precious, precious blood, too busy for Him, too busy, too busy to be able to have time to serve Him, too busy to give back to Him, too busy to please Him. This is his own redeemed children. They may have vision for everything in life, including planning vacations and planning retirement and planning children and grandchildren and planning everything. 
but have no vision for what is dearest and nearest to the heart of Jesus. They are so bogged down with their problems. They're so bogged down with their needs. They're so bogged down with their recreation. They're so bogged down with their sports. They're so big, bogged down with their leisure and their own fulfillment. But not his great commission. Ask me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance. I'm personally convinced that while, yes, every generation's past, They always lived with the expectations of the return of Christ. I know that. I read history. There's some even foolish people who basically gave up everything, put white robes, and went to the mountains waiting for Jesus. Now, that's foolishness because Jesus said, occupy till I come. Work hard (laughs) until I come so that when he comes, he's going to find me working hard. Ain't no white robes for me in the mountains. No, sir. I'm going to be in the thick of it. But I know also what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He talks about the birth of a baby. Well, the first eight months, you know, there was just no big deal. Yeah, occasional pain. But then comes toward the end. There's a baby being born, and Jesus said, you know, because there always have been wars and rumors of wars, always been earthquakes, always have been these things. He said, oh, but when the labor pangs become close intervals. You better get ready to go to the hospital. (laughs) When you're getting close, seeing them every day, it's a daily occurrence. You know that the baby is getting ready to be born. I don't know about you. That excites me. (laughs) That makes me lift up my head and look for my day of redemption. The baby is about to be born. Jesus on the way back. Jesus is coming soon. And may we wake up in time and have oil in our lamps so we can be ready. Amen. Okay, help me out here now. Man's what? The father's what? The son's what? Finally, the Holy Spirit's able deliverance. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. He's equal with the Father and the Son. There is no inequality. And that's why these people want to fight over, you know, husband, wife. And I said, it's just like in the Trinity. There's equality. The husband and wife are equal in the sight of God. They're equal in every way. They just fulfill different roles. And the same thing in the Trinity. The Father fulfills certain roles. The Son fulfills certain roles. The Holy Spirit fulfills certain roles. And his task is to call people and say to them, turn to the Son. He's forever calling people, believe in the Son. Turn to the Son so that the Father may accept you. Turn to the Son so that the Father may receive you. Turn to the Son so that the Father may bless you. Look at verses 10 to 12. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned. You rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you destroyed in your way. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all, how many? Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Have you taken refuge in Him? If you haven't, you can today. God the Holy Spirit takes no pleasure in sending people to judgment. The Holy Spirit of God longs for men and women, boys and girls, to come and turn to God the Son. That's his greatest joy. God the Holy Spirit would rather save people than condemn them into a Christless eternity. Of of verse 12, can read just as well, in fact, more accurately, kiss the Son, lest the Father be angry. Kiss the Son. 
Let's the Father be angry. In fact, here the Holy Spirit makes three appeals. Three appeals. First, he appeals to the mind, be wise. Then he appeals to the will, serve the Lord with fear. And thirdly, he appeals to the heart. Kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. Give up your pride. Give up your pride lest you perish. Give up your indifference before it's too late. Kiss the Son, for after all, He kissed you when He hung on that cross. Beloved, today, God's Holy Spirit speaks with grace and speaks in grace. But on the final day, He will speak in wrath, or wrath, as they say in England. Don't judge things by their temporary appearance. Today, you can elevate your vision to see beyond this veil and begin to live with eternity in mind. I promise you, it will make your life not just meaningful, but extremely meaningful. Can I get an amen? Thank you for being part of our worship today. We would love to hear from you. Please contact us and tell us about what God is doing in your life. If you are in the Atlanta area, we hope that you can visit us in person. I'd love to shake your hands. May God bless you today and throughout the week.